I can give you some considerations that you should think about, uh, or you may want to think about at least in making the decision. So one key consideration is how much will it help your academic career? Uh, and that will vary a lot by field. Some fields are so-called book fields where it is pretty much expected that you will write at least one book and possibly more. Uh, I think some fields in history are like this. Uh, on the other hand, at the other extreme, there are fields which are primarily article fields uh, where you're gonna be judged mostly by articles and there is no expectation that you'll write a book. Uh, people might even think that you're weird or strange for trying to write one. And a lot of fields are in between where it's not necessarily essential that you can write a book, uh, but uh, it may be something that will help your career in any event. If you're not sure what kind of field you're in in that respect, uh, the best approach is to ask more senior scholars uh, and ask them what they think. You may also want to take a look to see who are some of the most successful scholars in your field over the last 10 or 20 years. If those people are primarily known for their books, most of them, that's a sign that uh, it's a field where books are important to advancement. If on the other hand, they're mostly known for their articles, that might be evidence in the other direction. Uh, so how much this will advance your career will depend a lot uh, in, on, in your field. Uh, there are also some issues which are advantages of the book format over a conventional academic article format that you should consider. One of them obviously is a book can be much longer and discuss an issue in greater depth. So if you want to look at a really big question uh, or a really uh, sophisticated and complex one, then sometimes it makes sense to write a book. You could potentially write a series of articles instead, uh, but a book can be better integrated. Uh, another situation where the book format has advantages is if you want to write an interdisciplinary book that appeals to people in multiple different fields. Uh, for example, my book, Democracy and Political Ignorance, which was previously mentioned, uh, it appeals obviously to people in my own field of law because there's uh, some issues there about constitutional design, but it also has interest to political scientists, economists, and others. Had I published this uh, in a series of law journals in my field, maybe other law professors would have read it, but it's very unlikely that people in those other fields would have read it. Whereas for various reasons, uh, people are more likely to read a book that's not exactly in their field or a book that's interdisciplinary than to read an academic journal uh, in an article or in a journal uh, which is not from your own field. So for instance, very few law professors will read very many economics or history journal articles. Uh, very few economists will read law journal articles and so on. Uh, and this is one of many places where uh, I'll take the opportunity to remind you that this is a talk about the world of academic publishing, the world of academia as it actually exists, not necessarily as it should be. So you might say professors should read more articles outside of their fields, uh, but many of them are lazy and uh, or just simply don't have time and so they don't. Uh, the book format can help you break through uh, that barrier. And indeed, that did work for me with democracy and political ignorance. Uh, I was able to reach a much wider audience within academia uh, than I otherwise would have. Uh, another advantage of the book format is if your, your topic is at all one that you hope will reach not only academics, but interested members of the general public, uh, those people are far more likely to read a book uh, than they are to read an academic journal article. Very, very few academic journal articles uh, ever get read by, any, by anybody other than other scholars. Indeed, many of them won't even be read by other scholars. Uh, however, with books, uh, there is a higher proportion of them that can break into the sort of mainstream market, so to speak, or at least the market of uh, readers who are very interested in the topic, but are not themselves scholars. Uh, and that uh, certainly uh, was the case uh, with uh, democracy and political ignorance, and also with my most recent book, Free to Move, uh, where I had the self-conscious goal of reaching the uh, for a large community of people who are interested in issues of migration, uh, issues of constitutional design, other questions that I addressed in this book, which is about voting with your feet, both through international migration, uh, but also voting with your feet uh, domestically. 
Uh, and finally, of course, this book is an example of how uh, you can cover a wider range of material uh, and have a greater sweep to your argument in a book uh, than you can in an article. There is no way that I could have covered this range of issues uh, in just an article without being very superficial and crude. Uh, in the book, maybe I was still crude or superficial. Uh, you can judge that for yourself if you read the book, but I was at least less so than I would have been uh, had I tried to just put this all into one article, which is much uh, shorter. Uh, so these are the potential advantages of writing a book. Uh, there is uh, one big disadvantage, and that is uh, what economists call opportunity cost. Uh, that you, that, that it, books take a very long time to write. Uh, it's a lot of effort. Uh, some people analogize writing a book to raising a child. It's not quite that time consuming, but the analogy is not entirely misplaced. Uh, so early in my career, I thought that if a book was the same length as five articles, then it should take about the same amount of time to write as five articles. But in reality, it's actually more time than that. So if the book is the same length as five articles, it may well, uh, instead of uh, taking the same length uh, as, of time as those articles, it may actually take twice as long. Uh, or the like. So you have to think carefully, you know, what will most benefit your career, writing that book or writing the several articles you could have written in the same time. And similarly, uh, you have to think about where you are in your life in general. If you have very small children, as I do, then, you know, obviously that is another uh, consideration to some degree uh, that raises the opportunity cost of writing a book. Uh, and uh, so uh, those costs are high, but I think in some cases they're worth it. You will have to weigh for yourself uh, whether they are or not. Uh, but let's assume you've decided you do want to uh, write a book. Uh, congratulations. The next step to consider is choosing a publisher. Uh, that there are dozens of academic publishers out there. Uh, many of them are university presses, uh, presses that are associated with a particular university like Harvard or Yale or Chicago or Oxford or Cambridge. They're also so-called commercial academic publishers, which are independent of any given university. Uh, they're independent, usually for-profit institutions, but many of them uh, specialize in academic uh, types of books. So uh, as a general rule, when you submit a proposal or a manuscript, my view is you should try to submit to three or four publishers at once. So you have to decide which ones you're going to pick. Uh, and the simplest initial answer is that at least in my field of law and also in major social science and humanities fields related to it, like history, economics, political science, and so on, uh, the biggest name publishers in the academic world, world are these ones up on the screen right now, Oxford, Chicago, Princeton, Harvard University Press, Yale, uh, and Cambridge. I'm not saying they're actually the best in some objective sense. What I'm saying is that they're the best known and most prestigious, at least in these fields that I'm familiar with. Uh, and therefore, if your goal is to get a publisher uh, that will be a big name on your CV or your resume, and it will be impressive to other academics, uh, then these presses are the ones that you should look to first, at least if you're in any of the fields uh, that I'm familiar with. Uh, after that, uh, it's much more difficult to tell. There are a few other publishers which you might think of as just below this level, uh, like Stanford University Press, University of Michigan, and some others. Uh, as a crude general rule, uh, the prestige of a university press is going to be closely correlated uh, with the prestige of the university that it's associated with. Uh, so Ivy League University Press will have a higher standing than Podunk University Press. And that's true regardless of whether Podunk does an as good or better job of actually producing and editing the book uh, than Ivy League University Press. Most academics don't know that much about uh, the ins and outs of particular academic presses. They will judge it just by the prestige of the press or often just by the prestige of the university associated with the press. Again, this is another area where maybe things should be different from the way that they are, but this is uh, actually how they are. Uh, similarly, with commercial academic presses, 
Uh, as a general rule, the commercial academic presses, even the best ones, are prestige-wise a little bit below these top six publishers, uh, but uh, some of them uh, are nonetheless quite prestigious. I think, though, that with the commercial academic presses, the degree of their prestige varies a lot by field. So, for instance, Rutledge, which is a well-known one, has very high standing in political theory, but not as much in some other fields that I'm aware of. If you're not sure uh, where presses stand in your field, then again, consult more serious scholars, ask them what they think about it. Uh, and uh, you'll get an answer that way. I should note also that sometimes a given press uh, will have a series uh, in a particular field or is particularly well known for publishing books in your field. So for instance, the University of North Carolina Press is well known for its series on Civil War history. Uh, the University of Kansas Press, of which I'm a big fan, they have a great series on legal history and another one in American military history. So people who are clued in and in the know, they will know things like that. But sadly, many academics will not know that. Uh, many academics would just say, oh, the University of Kansas Press, that's a university I know mostly because of its basketball team, so the press can't be all that good. Uh, so to the extent that you care about prestige, what it will look like on your resume and the like or your CV, uh, you will want to pay attention to these kind of crude prestige orderings. Uh, there is obviously also some variation in terms of quality, production values, how good the editing is and so on. To my mind, that varies less by press uh, than it does by the individual editor that you're working with. So uh, what you may wanna do, if you have a choice of several options is to uh, talk, find out who the editor in your field is uh, and uh, see what that person's reputation is. Uh, hopefully find other people in your field who've published with that press uh, and see how they liked working uh, with the editor there. Uh, but uh, in some ways, the particular person may often be more important in that respect than the uh, you know, sort of the, the press that you're working with. But in terms of prestige rankings, it is roughly as I indicated, though there is going to be some variation in particular fields. And if you're unsure, uh, again, talk to more senior scholars. Or if you can't talk to them, uh, look at who the most prestigious uh, academics in your field publish with. Uh, if a lot of them are publishing with, say, University of Kansas, that's a sign that maybe that press has unusually high standing in your field. Uh, but again, in most cases, this general pecking order I mentioned earlier, that is the way it works. Maybe it shouldn't work that way, but uh, it is. At least that's true with respect to American academic presses, uh, and the American ones are also well known in most other countries, at least where academics uh, follow literature in English. If you want to talk about British or Canadian academic presses, I know a bit about them and I can talk about them in questions uh, if people are interested. Uh, so having decided where you're going to submit your manuscript, uh, I'd like to talk about the issue of how do you get your manuscript or your proposal actually accepted by the publisher, which seems like a pretty important part of the process uh, because your book will not get very far if no one wants to publish it. Uh, and when you submit the book, roughly speaking, you have two options that you can go with. You can actually write an entire manuscript or you can submit a proposal. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about the proposal route because with the manuscript, a lot will just depend on the quality of the manuscript as a whole. So, of course, they'll just be reading that. Uh, and with the manuscript, you'll mostly just be sending a short cover letter. But uh, I will note that there are advantages and disadvantages to both the proposal route and the manuscript route. Uh, the advantage of the proposal route uh, is that you have to write only a much shorter document. It's usually about no more than 10 or 15 pages. Uh, and therefore, if the project fails, you won't have used up such an enormous amount of time. On the other hand, if you write an entire manuscript and for whatever reason you can't get it published, then you've lost a huge amount of time. And I've seen this happen. I was once peer reviewer for a press where you know, the, the person submitted like a 400 page manuscript and it was totally terrible and completely unpublishable. Uh, and whoever wrote that thing, they spent an enormous amount of time and got nothing out of it. Uh, the advantage of doing the manuscript route is that you probably only have to go through peer review once. 
so uh, they'll send it out to peer reviewers and they'll rule on it and they'll decide yes or no on the manuscript. On the other hand, if you did a proposal route, the proposal will have to go to peer review, but then when you get a contract and you eventually produce the actual manuscript, uh, then it will usually have to go through peer review again. And it can happen that uh, the proposal passed peer review, but the manuscript did not. And that can be a painful moment, though you potentially can still uh, publish the manuscript uh, with another publisher if uh, your initial one decides to throw it out. Uh, so I'm going to focus uh, for the most part now on the proposal route, uh, and I'll talk about what should be in your proposal. Uh, and there's many different uh, possible ways to write a proposal. In my view, I don't think there's one form of organization that is best for everyone, and I've seen a lot of different uh, types of organization work for people. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you, you know, paragraph one must say this and paragraph two must say that or the white code, though there are guides to proposal writing that go into that level of detail. What I will tell you instead is four things that I think absolutely must be in almost any proposal that is likely to succeed. First, it must say what your thesis is. Like, what is the main point or argument of your book? Uh, you might say, well, it's pretty obvious that that should be in there, but I have read proposals on a number of occasions where it's not at all clear from the proposal what argument or what point the person is trying to make. If it's unclear to the peer reviewer, as I was in those cases, it, it pro the proposal will probably be rejected. So you wanna be very clear about this is what I'm doing. Second, uh, you should explain why the idea is new and how it's different from existing literature. Uh, because in the academic world, we reward people for original scholarship, not just for repeating or restating what other people have said. Uh, and if necessary, you will need to include a section saying these are previous books on related topics, but here's why my is, mine is different. It's doing something that those other writers did not do. Third, you should explain why is this topic important? Why should people care? Again, in some cases, it's obvious. Uh, you know, when I wrote the book on democracy and political ignorance, it's relatively obvious why political ignorance matters and why the voters being poorly informed could be a problem. In some cases, it may not be obvious, uh, but still, the less obvious it is, the more clearly you have to explain this is why this matters. Maybe it only matters because specialists in the field care about it. But even then, if possible, you should try to explain why getting this issue right uh, can have an impact in the wider world, even if it's an issue that only a few specialists will understand. Uh, and finally, you should explain what the audience for the book is and what the potential market is. Uh, it may be in some cases that the audience is only other experts in the field. If so, you should explain, at least explain why those experts are likely to buy the book. If it can reach out to people in other fields or to the general public, or if it can be used as a textbook in a class, make sure to point that out. Uh, in theory, academic publishers that are university presses are supposed to be nonprofit, and they should publish good scholarship irrespective of whether it makes them money or not. In reality, most of them, in fact, do care about the money, and therefore, the larger the potential audience for your book, the more likely it is that they're going to accept it. You can argue that they shouldn't be that way. Uh, they should care only about ideas, and they should be indifferent to money, but that's not the way that it is. Uh, and obviously that's even more true for commercial academic publishers who even as a matter of theory, they're in the business of making money, uh, most of them, uh, and therefore they will wanna know that uh, as well. Uh, so those things should be in your proposal. There is one other point that I would note, uh, and that is that if you are challenging conventional wisdom in your field, if you're making an argument uh, that uh, you know, you know, most other scholars in your field will disagree with, then you should think about what are the likely responses to your argument and prefigure your rebuttals to them. Strictly speaking, in that maybe that only needs to be done in the manuscript, but in reality, peer reviewers and the editors at the press uh, will be interested in that and they will be more interested and more on the lookout for that if you're challenging uh, conventional wisdom. Uh, so uh, this, I think, is especially important 
for those of you uh, who are conservative or libertarian in most academic fields, the majority of scholars and also of editors uh, are left wing. Uh, and therefore, they will be more on the lookout for is this person addressing what I think is the obvious counter argument. There's a little bit of a double standard there that if you're making a, a more left wing, more conventional argument, conventional for the field, uh, then this will be less on their minds. But again, this is another area you have to deal with the system as it is. Uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, therefore, the more you're challenging conventional wisdom, particularly on an ideologically charged subject, uh, the more it is the case uh, that uh, you want to uh, explain uh, you know, how you're going to, or preview how you're going to respond to uh, arguments. Uh, lastly, there is the issue of dealing with peer reviewers. In most cases, uh, your proposal will first go to an editor. If the editor just doesn't like the proposal or doesn't think that it fits the press's interest, uh, they may just reject it out of hand. Uh, but uh, if they want to give a consideration, they will send it out to peer reviewers. Uh, usually two, but sometimes as many as three or four. Uh, sometimes the editor will ask you for possible suggestions for peer reviewers. You should be prepared to suggest two or three names to that person. Uh, those people should be prestigious leading scholars in your field, as big names as possible. They should be people that know that you know like your work, because there's nothing worse than uh, you giving them a name of the peer reviewer, them using the name that you gave, and then that person saying, you know, uh, Joe's proposal really sucks and you should reject it. So you should give them names that you think will, you have good reason to think will think favorably of your work. Uh, on the other hand, these are people who should not be at your own university. Uh, because then they'll suspect a conflict of interest. If you're a libertarian or a conservative, uh, at least most of your suggested names uh, should be left of center people. If you give them a list of other libertarians or other conservatives, if that's what your views are, they will think or they may think, well, uh, only people who agree with this person uh, actually like his or her work. Uh, and again, this is another double standard. Uh, if a liberal or a left-wing writer submits an, a list of mostly left-wing peer reviewers, uh, then uh, you know that they probably won't think that, but you have to live with this uh, problem. Then uh, it will be sent out to the peer reviewers. They may or may not be people that you suggested, uh, and you will get back peer review reports. If the peer review reports are extremely negative, uh, there's not much you can do. The proposal will probably be rejected. If they're very positive for the most part, then the proposal will likely be accepted. Uh, you will still have to write a response to the reviewers, but in that response, you can just say, yes, thank you to the reviewers that they recommend my work. Uh, and if they suggest various small adjustments, you can say, well, I'm open to considering them or something like that. You might well get an intermediate case where the reviewers say some things that are positive and some things that are negative, and so things are somewhat on defense. In that situation, the response that you write to the reviewers will be extremely important. You may be tempted to just say that if the reviewers criticize your, your proposal, you will be very tempted. I know I'm tempted when this happens to say, well, you know, here's my response. My response is that these reviewers are a bunch of morons. They don't understand how great my work is. Uh, they don't understand how profound and pathbreaking my ideas are. So their suggestions are all stupid and I should, and, and I'm just gonna reject them. Uh, and while this will be tempting, it probably won't be good for your proposal and your chances uh, of having it be accepted. Uh, they, uh, the editor chose those reviewers because they think those people have useful insight and know a lot about the field. So if you look like you're just rejecting their ideas out of hand, that won't look good. What you should do is look for places where you can agree with the things that they said and say, well, you know, I can integrate this idea into the uh, structure of my existing proposal. Uh, if you can't fully integrate it, you can at least say, why, well, but here's a different way that this problem could be addressed. And in places where you just have to reject the suggestion because you just think it's completely wrong or because it won't work in the context of your book, then you should explain as politely as possible why you're rejecting it. And if at the same time you're able to accept some of the reviewer's suggestions, you will be in a better position to be able to reject others. Remember that your goal here is not to win some sort of debate with the peer reviewers. Your goal is to get your proposal accepted. So 
being nice, being conciliatory and seeming reasonable in most cases is a better way to doing it, of doing it than sort of getting up on your high horse and saying like, you know, I'm the only one who really understands these topic. All these other people are a bunch of morons and, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, so it's going to be my way or the highway. In many cases, if you take that attitude, they will send you packing on the highway. Uh, so uh, you won't actually succeed in that way. Uh, so finally, I should note one point about the mechanics of submission that when you initially submit, if at all possible, you should just email your proposal directly to the editor at the that particular press who's responsible for your particular uh, field. Often uh, on the websites of the presses, uh, they will have the list of editors and uh, it will be listed uh, which one does which fields. If you can, you can probably find their email there. If you can't find it on the website, you can find out some other way, perhaps from other scholars who publish with that press, but submitting it directly to the editor is much better than submitting it through some kind of general uh, portal that might exist on the website. And it's certainly much better than sending them something by snail mail. Uh, the more immediately you could get it uh, under the eyes of the person who will actually be making a decision, the better off that you will be. And that's true even if uh, technically the website says, well, everybody must submit through some portal. Even if it says that, you're probably still better off emailing the particular editor, uh, regardless of what the official rules say. So let's say uh, you've done a proposal, you've gotten it through, uh, and now you actually have to write the book. Uh, in some ways, that might be particularly hard because if you're like me and you're like a lot of people, when you try to write, it's a constant battle against time wasting and procrastination. Uh, usually, uh, your contract that you sign uh, will call on you to submit the book within, say, six months or a year, something like that. Uh, and uh, you will uh, be very tempted to instead spend your time on other things, other projects with more immediate deadlines, things that are more fun, obligations with your family, or even just surfing the internet rather than writing on the day that you're supposed to be writing. Uh, so this is very tempting, and I don't have a brilliant solution for it. If I did, I would have published a lot more books and other projects than I actually have. But broadly speaking, uh, I think there's two ways that you can address this. One is you can learn to be more efficient in your use of time. I don't have brilliant ideas for how to do this, but if you want to go this route, there's a book by Jason Brennan called Good Work If You Can Get It, which he published last year, which is all about time management and organization for academics. So if you read Jason's book, he has a lot of brilliant advice. Uh, and if you take it and follow it, you will be much more efficient in your writing. There's only one problem uh, in order to follow his advice or that of other people who have similar ideas, it requires a good deal of self-control. And lack of self-control is precisely one of the big reasons why people like me and many other academics are procrastinators in the first place. So if you're like that and you feel like you won't easily change, you can adopt the other strategy of knowing this about yourself and building in time for it. So I know, for instance, that Many times when I sit down and try to work, sometimes I just won't be able to do it. So I try to set up enough blocks of time where I can sit down and work such that if I work, if I actually do work only during some of them, I can still get the project done. Similarly, I try to learn under what conditions uh, I'm most efficient and most likely able to work effectively. For me, it's sitting in my basement office like I am right now. Uh, and in a place that's as quiet as possible. For somebody else, it might be in their office at their university. It might be at a coffee shop. It might be somewhere else. Learn where you're most efficient. Learn whether you're better off in total quiet or whether having some music playing in the background is good for you and try to write under those conditions as much as possible. And also, one way that I battle the procrastination and time wasting is that uh, in moments when I am in the groove, when I can force myself to work, then I push ahead for as long as possible. And I try to build into my schedule things such that I have the ability to do it. Uh, and similarly, uh, you should know your pace of work and therefore 
work with the editor initially to build up a deadline such that it's realistic for you. It's easier to ask for a slightly longer deadline from the get-go than if you violate the deadline and then ask for more time after the fact. Most academic publishers will let you violate the deadline by a few days or even two or three or four weeks, but the more you push beyond it, the more their confidence in you will wane uh, and the more you risk potentially uh, poisoning the relationship. So this issue of procrastination and time wasting is an extremely important one. I don't have a complete solution for it, uh, but my hope is that if you've taken the time to listen to this seminar, that in itself uh, is an indication that you're more hardworking uh, and less lazy than I am, uh, and therefore it will you can uh, you know you can battle through it. And if somebody as lazy as I am can publish six or seven academic books, uh, then hopefully you can too. Uh, so I want to talk next a little about the organization of the book manuscript itself. Obviously, this is going to vary enormously depending on the topic of the book, your writing style and so forth. Uh, but I think a few general principles uh, could potentially help. Uh, one is that uh, you should have a clear introduction to the book, which lays out what your main argument is and also how different chapters later in the book will fit into it. And in each chapter also, it's good to point out this is what this chapter is about. This is how it ties into the rest of the book. Uh, you, 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 in order to not make the book sound too clinical or technical, it is desirable, particularly in the introduction, often to have a story or something that's attention grabbing. So in my book, Free to Move, which is about migration and voting with your feet, uh, early on, I tell the story of Frederick Douglass, uh, the famous escaped slave and abolitionist, and how he uh, understood the importance of freedom of movement, not just within the United States or for other escaped slaves, but also he was a big advocate of free immigration as well. So the story of Frederick Douglass is an attention grabbing device. Uh, and I similarly included the story of J.D. Vance, the author of Hillbilly Elegy, where I argue that Vance, who is very famous, uh, his story is best understood as an example of the success of voting with your feet, even though Vance himself doesn't understand uh, it in that particular way. Uh, so uh, you want to have both a clear organization and also attention grabbing uh, stories, particularly if you want to reach people who are not experts in your field, uh, you want to make sure that your writing is as clear as possible. And uh, there's various different ways that you can do that, but you should at least be aware of this issue. And if you're not sure if you're being clear, ask someone to read your manuscript who is interested in the subject, but is not an expert in that field. In my case, sometimes it's my wife. She knows a lot about the things I write about, but she's not herself an academic specializing in them. If it's unclear to her, that probably means that I've done a bad job and I need to make it clear. Similarly, you can ask your editor about this. Often editors are very good at um, uh, dealing with these sorts of issues. Uh, I wanna talk also very briefly about substantive issues in your book. Obviously those vary greatly by your topic and how you plan to address it. Uh, but I would note that particularly for books that address controversial issues and particularly for challenging conventional wisdom, you need to think very carefully uh, about uh, uh, how, what possible arguments can be raised against your position and how you're going to respond to them. You may not be able to respond to everything, but you do need to uh, respond to at least those things that are most likely to be raised by other experts in your field, or in some cases also by lay readers, if you expect that there will be uh, lay readers of the book. Uh, so, uh, for example, in my book, The Grasping Hand, uh, which attacks the Supreme Court's famous decision in Kilo versus City of New London, a ruling which said that the government can take your property and give it to another private owner for the sake of promoting economic development, I knew uh, that most people in my field thought the Kilo was correctly decided and it was just fine. So I had to think about why did they think that? How would they respond to my arguments? Ideally, you should read the opposing literature so you know what their views are. But even if there isn't literature on the specific point you're making, or you can't find it or whatever, at least ask yourself this question. If it was my job to respond to my argument, what would I argue against myself? Uh, it's a question I had to ask way back 
when I was in high school debate, when I first learned it, it's useful for academics as well. If an argument occurs to you as a potentially powerful response to your position, uh, then it will probably occur to other people and you need to include it. In some cases, you also need to include arguments that you yourself think are weak uh, or even stupid, but if a lot of people believe them, you need to address it. So in the grasping hand, I addressed the argument that the position that I was arguing was uh, very similar to the Supreme Court's notorious 1905 decision in a case called Wachner versus New York. I think there's actually little, if anything, in common between that case and what I was arguing for, but a lot of people think the opposite, uh, and therefore I had to address it whether I wanted to uh, or not. Uh, so uh, obviously there's a lot of other details that will vary based on uh, the nature of your book, uh, but uh, it's, these are some general points that you should consider. Uh, you should also perhaps briefly consider the issue of whether you want to take a hand in the cover design. Uh, in general, uh, when I started this process early on in my career, I thought, well, the publisher, the experts in cover design, I'll just leave it to them. And in some cases, I've done just that. But sometimes they will suggest cover designs that are just really, really bad. Uh, and in that case, they will often let you put your foot down and say, no, I'm not going to accept this. And I have a contrary suggestion instead. So uh, for the grasping hand, the press's initial uh, design was the one on the left, which to my mind at least tells you absolutely nothing about what the book is about. I suggested something like the, what became the one on the right, which is the actual cover, which conveys the idea that the government is taking people's homes, which is what the book is about. So to my mind, and I think to that of most readers, uh, the design on the right is much better. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm glad I put my foot down. And if you reject their idea and have a reasonable one of your own, it, uh, then uh, often publishers will go along with that, particularly if your idea is not expensive or if it utilizes a picture or image that's uh, not one that they have to pay for that, you know, pay to the copyright holder or the like. So uh, let's say you've completed your book, it's been published, congratulations, that's a great achievement. Many academics feel, well, when that happens, uh, then my work is done. Uh, but in most cases, they're mistaken uh, because for most academics, you also have to promote your book. Unless you're already very famous, uh, then the publisher probably will make only a modest effort uh, to promote your book and you will have to do most of the work yourself. You can negotiate with the publisher to uh, send out copies to particular people and also to give you uh, free author copies. You can discuss that at the stage at which you're writing your contract. Another thing to discuss at the stage of when you're negotiating about the contract is if you think that uh, that your book uh, might be bought by people who are not academics with expense accounts, then you will want to discuss with the publisher uh, the need to set a reasonable, uh, not too high price. This is actually the main thing that I negotiate with book publishers when I'm talking about contracts. Otherwise, many academic publishers will price your book at $80 or $100 or even more, and nobody will be able to buy it but academic libraries. That's fine if you expect the book will only go to libraries and only other experts in the field will be interested in it, but it's terrible if you think you want to reach a larger audience, uh, so you want to make sure that there's a reasonable price and that the time to discuss that is at the stage when you're talking about the contract. Uh, and especially you will have some leverage if you have more than one offer uh, that you're looking at. So uh, broadly speaking, there's two audiences that you might want to reach. One is the audience of other academics. The other is the audience of people in quote unquote, the real world. Uh, to promote to the academic world, there's a number of steps uh, that you can take. One is make a list of who are the 20 or 30 or 40 people in the academic world or in related places like think tanks uh, who are the ones most likely to take an interest in this topic or most likely to review it uh, and email them to let them know that the book is coming out and also send them copies of the book. Uh, and 
uh, the publisher might be willing to do this for you. If they're not willing to do it, if at all possible, use your author copies to do it. Uh, most publishers will let you buy discounted copies beyond the ones that you buy for free. So if you have the money to do it, by all means, try to. You might say it's not worth it, it's a waste of money, but if even one or two really important people hears about your book this way, they review it, or to like, uh, not only would this be great for the book, but you might even earn the money back. So in one instance, with democracy and political ignorance, one of the people that I sent a copy of this book to uh, was a Japanese academic that I knew, and he uh, read it and he liked it. And he said, why don't I do a Japanese translation of the book? Uh, he approached an academic publisher in Japan. We did a translation. Uh, and uh, uh, the income from the translation was not enormous, but it was enough to pay for all the books that I sent to everybody. Uh, so that's just one example. Even if most of your efforts at outreach fail, those that succeed can uh, make up for uh, the failures elsewhere. In addition, you should know about the schools and other institutions that have workshops or conferences uh, that relate to topics uh, that are covered in your book. You should contact those organizations, suggest that you can give a talk at the conference or at the school about them. Uh, and, uh, uh, and if at all possible, uh, that you can get speaking engagements that way. In addition to ones at universities, uh, you should also contact think tanks, and research institutes that uh, have an interest in your topic, uh, including uh, ones that, uh, uh, if you're a libertarian or a conservative, places like the Cato Institute and the like that have an interest in that field. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, therefore, try to contact as wide a range of people as possible about both speaking engagements and also reviewing the book and the like. Send it out also to leading academic journals in your field and possibly public policy or other similar journals as well. Uh, promotion in the real world in some ways is a more difficult business and not all books lend themselves to it. But if you have a topic that may be of interest to people uh, who are not academics, uh, then you want to reach out as much as possible to organizations that are not academic ones or not at least university based like think tanks and others. You should also make sure that review copies are sent out to uh, popular media like major newspapers and websites and the like. Also blogs that write about uh, the topics that you're interested in, some of which may be run by academics. Uh, it was mentioned, Tyler Cowen was mentioned earlier. His blog, Marginal Revolution, covers many issues in economics and public policy. And if your book is mentioned there, that's really good for getting uh, attention for it. Ideally, you can also leverage your book to write op-eds related to the topic, especially if there are things going on in the news related to it. In Q&A, if people are interested, I can talk in more detail about how to get yourself into the op-ed world and how to leverage uh, your book in that way. Uh, since the pandemic, there have been more online speaking engagements than before. And while in-person ones will continue, uh, I think the online ones will continue as well. And that opens up more opportunities, which is another topic we can talk about in Q&A if people are interested. So the biggest rule for promotion and really for the entire rest of this process is that you have to accept the idea that you will need to reach out to a lot of people and institutions. And that many of that, uh, those outreach uh, efforts will result in rejections. Many of those rejections are painful at the time that they happen. Every single book I've ever published was rejected by at least one of the publishers that I sent it to. Uh, for every speaking engagement or op-ed that I've had, there's probably another one where I you know, I try to do an op-ed or I try to do a speaking engagement, but people said, no, we're not interested. And it's annoying and painful at the time, but you have to learn to deal with it. You have to press on and you have to remember that the outside world will only see the successes. Nobody will know that your book was rejected by Prince University Press and by Harvard University Press and whatever other press rejected it. If it was published by Oxford or by Cambridge, uh, or one good press, nobody will know how many others said no to it. Uh, and the same goes for uh, the rest of this. So uh, if you put in the time and do the outreach, there is a good chance that you will be successful. So I now conclude, but I very much look forward to the questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. 
All right. Thank you so much, Professor, for such an excellent and uh, informative uh, presentation. We have a lot of great questions, so I'll just I'll lead off with the first. Uh, uh, first question is, uh, I'm an independent scholar, not a professor, uh, except an occasional adjunct. Uh, are academic presses realistic publishers of a book by an independent researcher like me, or should I seek uh, something else? It's a good question. I think it depends on your credentials. Uh, so one point that I probably should have included in the list of what should be in your proposal is an explanation of why are you the right person to write about this. And so uh, there will be more skepticism about that point if you're not an academic or you're not a think tank scholar or to like somebody with a, uh, who has an institutional affiliation. But uh, if, for instance, you've written previous articles or books on the same topic, in particular, if those articles are in prestigious academic journals or are well cited, you can point that out in your proposal uh, and explain how that makes you qualified to do it. If you really publish nothing or almost nothing, and you also have no institutional affiliation, then you're in a much tougher position. And I would almost suggest that you might be better off first publishing some articles and then working your way up to the book. Though if you have a truly path-breaking idea or there's some other uh, way in which you have good credentials, like maybe you were personally involved in policy making about the issue or something, uh, there could be exceptions to that rule. Okay, great. Uh, so our next question, uh, you, during your presentation, you mentioned sort of the big names in, in the publishing field, in the book publishing field. Um, are there like easily searchable uh, field specific um, like lists of these publishers? Uh, or is this something where you just kind of have to ask around? Uh, I, I know, for instance, uh, the, the uh, lighter blog for philosophy yeah. uh, has like surveys of, of scholars on their, their opinions of the top uh, uh, presses for different uh, fields of philosophy, but is this something that people should be able to find whatever their field is? I think the answer is they should be able to find it, but in some fields they actually can't because no one has done it. So the lighter blog and also I think the philosophy new blog have done a good job of this with philosophy, but in other fields, including my field of law, and I think perhaps also in political science and economics, there isn't really one easily findable ranking. So uh, the, the ones that I mentioned, those top six are going to be near the top for a wide range of field. But beyond that, uh, if you're not willing to sort of use the crude rules of thumb that I mentioned earlier, you do want to ask around. Uh, but I would note there's a lot of herd mentality in academia. And therefore, if you ask a few people what they say is likely to be representative of what the field in general thinks. Great. Uh, so our next question, uh, are top presses as big a deal to get published with as top journals? Uh, and in, in addition to that, for instance, would publishing with Cambridge University Press be more or less difficult than, say, getting a, a publication in American Economic Review? That's a good question. And I think it varies somewhat by the field. Uh, the uh, the more of a book field it is, so to speak, perhaps the more difficult it might be to get the press publication. In general, I feel like, at least in fields I'm familiar with, the presses are in some ways more open-minded and less rigid uh, than some of the top journals, which often have a very specific thing that they're looking for and are very rigid about format and the like, but that can vary a lot. And that's another thing that's more specific to a given field, just as the prestige of book publishing versus article publishing can vary by the field. So economics, I know, is more an article-driven field than a book field. So other things equal, a publication in American Economic Review may help you more than publishing a book with Cambridge University Press and economics, but the opposite could be true in some other fields. Hey, uh, our next questioner uh, asks, I, so I am hoping to turn my history PhD dissertation into a book. Is it wise to send in the existing manuscript or to submit a proposal based on the manuscript? Uh, I imagine the book being more in-depth and longer than the dissertation, but also once the manuscript is accepted, is it typical that you receive in advance as part of your contract with the publisher? Yeah. So that's really two different questions. The second one is easier to answer. Most academic authors do not get an advance, uh, especially if this is your first time uh, publishing. Uh, I've only started to get advances offered to me in the last uh, book or two that I've uh, published. Um, uh, earlier on, you know, they, they didn't give an, uh, an advance to me. Um, so you should not expect one. And if you do get one, 
uh, it probably will not be more than two or three thousand dollars. If you become very famous, if you're like Steve Pinker or Cass Sunstein or somebody like that, things might be different. In terms of turning dissertations into books, a lot depends on the nature of the dissertation. Uh, but if it's not organized in a way that's readily readable and accessible, uh, and many dissertations, I'm not saying this person is like this, but many dissertations are not very accessible and they're not very easily readable to people who aren't experts in the field, then you may be better off just drafting a proposal based on a dissertation and maybe giving them perhaps whatever you think is your most readable chapter. If on the other hand, your dissertation is very accessible and it already is organized in a way that a book should be, then you might be able to want to go the manuscript route and submit the, you know, the thing as a manuscript. You also could potentially revise your dissertation to make it more like a manuscript, uh, though obviously that can take more time. Great. Uh, next question. Uh, I've been told by some senior scholars that many presses, for instance, uh, Princeton uh, will not consider a proposal from a first time book author, only a full manuscript. I is that true? I don't know for sure about Princeton because I didn't submit them to them when I was doing my very first time. But I think in most cases that isn't true, that you can submit a proposal and they will consider it. They may view it with more skepticism if you're a first time author. And in general, sort of the more famous and prestigious you are in your field, the less skeptical they will be. So if you're very famous, you can actually write sort of a mediocre proposal and still get accepted. Because at that point they're saying, what we really value is Professor X and his or her reputation uh, rather than the details of the proposal. Uh, but in general, I think that the prestige of the author is less essential with many book publishers than it is sometimes with article submissions and the like. Um, uh, so it's certainly not fully de democratic or meritocratic prestige and name recognition the like do matter. Uh, but I think most presses uh, will consider uh, proposals by first time authors, particularly if the person explains here, my credentials for writing about this, here's why you know, the articles I've already published in this field and so on. Okay, uh, the, I'll kind of bundle these two questions together. So uh, will an editor send a book proposal, only a book proposal, not sample chapters or a manuscript out for peer review? Uh, yes. And secondly, how long should a book proposal be typically? Yeah, so they will send them out for peer review. That is the typical way of dealing with proposals. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it will initially first go to the editor. Uh, then the editor will decide whether it should be sent out for review or not. Uh, if he or she decides that they're interested enough to send it out for review, then they will in fact send it to reviewers. Um, and that, that's sort of a standard process. How long should it be? It depends somewhat on the field and on the nature of your topic and how long it is. I would guess between five and 15 pages in general. The longer your book is likely to be, uh, the longer the proposal probably needs to be. And also the more you're challenging conventional wisdom, uh, the more you will need to prefigure what are your responses to the sort of the, the conventional position. And that's especially true if people in the field, maybe many of them may be ideologically predisposed against your view. How long are you typically given to complete the book manuscript after receiving a contract? That's a good question. It, it can vary somewhat and you can actually negotiate a longer or shorter period, but in general, they will usually give you uh, about a year or so. Uh, you can submit it earlier than that. And usually as a practical matter, they, if you're submitted one day late, they won't say, okay, sorry, you know, we're throwing out your book, but uh, you don't wanna miss the deadline by too much. Is commercial potential, uh, that is accessibility to an audience uh, wider than just an academic one or people in the professional field exclusively, is that a smart argument to make in a proposal or is it going to be self-defeating? It's smart depending on the, the nature of the book. So, you know, if your book is something like, you know, here's my book about sort of uh, new technologies for archaeological digs or something, it's going to be very hard to argue that that can you know, appeal to a wider audience, but if your book is on a public policy issue or on a period in history or a legal uh, case, like a case before the Supreme Court or like that a lot of people are interested in, then you can plausibly make the case that there is a market for this which is not limited to the academic world. Uh, and you should make that case if you can. Uh, and 
Uh, if the case is a good one, it will increase your odds of getting the proposal accepted. And it will also increase the odds that you can persuade them to price the book in a reasonable way, uh, such that it really can be bought by people who are not academics, but expense accounts or not libraries. All right, the next questioner uh, asks, are sabbaticals good times to write books? Uh, they are, I'm starting my fifth year in the fall. Uh, when is a good time to start the book proposal if my sabbatical is the seventh year? <laughs> so my university actually doesn't have sabbaticals. So I've only had one or two semesters off in the entire like 18 years that I've been here. Uh, I think, yes, the more time you have available to you, uh, other things equal, that's a better time to do a proposal. And in many ways, it's an especially good time to actually write the book manuscript, which takes much more time in writing a proposal. Uh, there is obviously the issue of what else you're going to be doing during, during, uh, doing during your sabbatical. And you know your sort of how you know, your schedule works better than I do, obviously. But the more other things equal, the more time you have available, uh, the better that it is. Uh, is there uh, any difference or major difference uh, between writing academic books uh, versus textbooks? Yes, there is a big difference. And what I'm talking about here is actual book works of scholarship that make an original argument. I don't know as much about the textbook market, but it's somewhat different. And uh, it may be that may be a separate event that I just want to do with somebody who knows more about textbooks than I do, because I've never thought seriously about writing a textbook. I feel like for me, it would be too boring to try to do it. But textbooks can make money. Uh, and in some cases, you can become more influential in your field by publishing a widely used textbook. So the fact that it doesn't appeal to me doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't do it. If the book is based on peer reviewed papers that you've written, uh, what should you put in the proposal? Uh, should there be changes uh, from the papers as well? Like uh, That's a good question. Uh, oftentimes you will submit a book proposal that is based uh, uh, in part on your previous work uh, with journal articles. And you should note that you've done those articles that you'll be building on them. Uh, you can, and people often do, including me, incorporate pieces of their previous articles in the book, uh, but you shouldn't, and the publisher probably won't let you simply just you know, have a collection of essays or whatever that's have few or no changes from before. So you should expect that you will need to reorganize and rework uh, the material that you adapt uh, and you add new material to it, for instance, to take account of different counter arguments or additional literature that may have come out since your article was published. Uh, and you should expect, I know it was like this for me, that it takes longer to adapt articles and put them together in a book uh, than you might think that it does. Uh, and in most cases, you probably can't get away with just stringing together two or three articles in the group more articles with minimal changes, you will end up having to write uh, new material as well. Yeah, I've been told that sort of the rule of thumb is at least two thirds of the material for a book should typically be original. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't know if there is a rule of thumb and also there's, yeah. it's hard to draw a clear dividing line between what's original and what isn't. That's true. Uh, but my guess is that in terms of the words that are going to be in the book, in most cases, about half of those words or more are probably going to be ones that you have to write new for the book. Some of those will be completely new chapters or sections. Some of them will be sort of rewrites or restructuring of the stuff from the articles. There is an exception to that in that if you're a very senior and well-known scholar in your field, sometimes you can write just a collection of a collection of the essays of, of Ilya Soman or, or whoever. Um, but if you're at that point in your career, then you probably don't need my help with book publishing to begin with. If you're not at that stage where people will like read the collected works of such and such, um, then uh, you should put that possibility out of your mind, at least for now. And I don't know about other fields, but uh, in philosophy, there's the practice of the fest shift, right? At the end yeah. of a person's career, a bunch of scholars get together and tear apart everything that you've ever worked on in a celebration of your career. Uh, yeah, which so, I always find fun. So, so, yeah, so that's a different kind of a thing where it's not actually you just writing the book, it's yeah. uh, or the journal issue, it's, it's these other people that get invited. Yep. Uh, okay, so our next questioner uh, asks, uh, I have a complete manuscript, but plan to make changes to most chapters, including the introduction. Uh, they're more stylistic and organizational than substantive. Uh, I've been working on the manuscript for several years now, but should I wait until I have what I consider to be a more finished product or submit what I have now and see what changes a publisher or editor would like me to make? 
That's a really good question to which I'm not sure I have a definitive answer. I think it depends on how good a shape the manuscript is in now. If you think the manuscript is clear and readable, and if you uh, think also uh, you know, that it's a strong uh, contribution to the field substantively, then it may well be that you can just submit it now, because even if you put it in what you think is a completely finished form, the editor will almost always have suggestions of their own, the peer reviewers will have suggestions and so on. Uh, so if you think that it's a strong piece of work already, you don't necessarily have to put every single possible finishing touch on it. Uh, but if you think there are serious flaws or the like, then and you can fix them in a reasonable amount of time, then you might want to do that uh, to increase the odds that uh, the manuscript will be accepted. Uh, and when you send in a manuscript, as opposed to a proposal, usually you will send in a short cover letter where you still also want to explain these at least briefly explain these points that I mentioned uh, that need to be in the proposal also in more depth, like what is the book about? Why is it important? Why is it original? Uh, and also, you know, why are you the right person uh, to write this project and what is the audience? But in that event, it'll be a letter that's maybe one or two pages long as opposed to like a long and more detailed proposal. When choosing a publisher, are there predatory publishers for books the way there are predatory journals? I think there are uh, at the sort of the bottom of the academic heap. I don't know as much about them, but basically if it's a publisher that you haven't heard of and that nobody else in your field has heard of, it's possible they're a predatory publisher, but it's possible also that they're just an extremely low prestige publisher. And you can usually establish which one of those it is uh, um, by asking around. It, this does raise the question of sort of how low should you go on the totem pole of academic publishers before you uh, give up the idea of publishing a manuscript. And I think that depends to some extent on how people in your field view things. So in some fields, if you publish by the 50th or even the 100th uh, most prestigious publisher, that's still you know, a reasonable chit on your CV. Um, and whereas in some fields, they might say, well, if you published only with Podunk Press, then you know, that's a failure. That just shows you couldn't go higher. And if you're in doubt what the answer to that question is, uh, you should talk to, a, again, a more experienced person in your specific field. Uh, somewhat related, is it better to go with a second tier press rather than a first tier if time is a factor? Um, it depends on how much of a factor it is. In general, uh, the higher the press that you get, especially early in your career, the better it is. But if you have a situation where you know, you have to get the book accepted within the next year because you're coming up for tenure or something like that. Um, and for whatever reason, you think that the lower rank press will go through the process faster, then that's a good thing. That's an important consideration. In general, however, it does not seem to me that the speed of consideration varies greatly based on the press because they still have to go through peer review. Uh, they still have to send it out. And peer reviewers for lower prestige presses aren't necessarily faster on average than those for higher prestige ones. Like you might think that sort of the higher prestige academics uh, work more slowly or whatnot because they have you know, more things to do. On the other hand, the higher prestige academics are more efficient academics. That's one of the ways they succeeded to begin with. So I'll tell a brief story on that, that years ago, I was an editor for the Supreme Court Economic Review, which is an academic journal in my field. And I sent out a peer review, or I sent an article for peer review to Richard Posner, who not only is he a very famous scholar, but he was also, until he retired a couple of years ago, he was a federal judge. So I thought, you know, Posner is going to take the, you know, the one month period that we gave people to send in the review reports. I woke up the next morning uh, and I opened my email inbox and there was a lying and detailed review by Posner, uh, which was much better than most other peer reviews that I got from people who took a month to do them or whatnot. So, uh, so in general, uh, there's a lot of happenstance to how quickly a proposal gets evaluated, uh, but it doesn't necessarily correlate with the prestige of the publisher. But you should expect that the process will take at least in most cases, from submission of the proposal to contract, it will usually take at least two or three months. And sometimes it can take as long as six or seven months or even a bit longer, depending on how quickly they get the review reports back and how quickly certain stages of uh, consideration are gone through at the press itself. 
All right, uh, next questioner uh, says, my subfield emphasizes articles, but a book can be very helpful for getting promoted to full professor. Uh, how much overlap do you think is acceptable between one's published articles uh, and the book? Uh, this kind of came up already now that I read it, but I don't know if you got anything more to add to that. Sure, so I think in many fields, I'm not familiar obviously with, I don't know what field the particular individual is in. In many fields, it's a common practice that you will write a series of articles, then you will build it up into a book. Uh, so uh, some degree of overlap is normal and accepted. I think most scholars will recognize that. Uh, but uh, when you come up for renewal or tenure or promotion to full professor or whatnot, you should make it known to the people on that committee, like this is how my book goes beyond the article. Usually for most promotion processes or contract renewal process and the like, you will submit a, some kind of memo or the like describing your scholarships. You should say, I've written five articles about X topic and I've also written this book and the book goes beyond the articles in ways A, B, and C. You can say something like that. Great. Uh we only have about 10 minutes left. There are so many great questions. So I apologize in advance. If we don't have time to get to yours. Uh, but the next question is, what if the press has a sole submission policy? Is it still OK to send a proposal to more than one press? It's a good question. What I would say is that at least among leading academic publishers, it's increasingly accepted uh, that you can submit to more than one at once, and they sort of expect that. I mentioned earlier on that you should submit, you should initially submit to about three or four. The reason why I say that is not because there's a rule against submitting to more than that, but because if you submit to more than three or four, you're going to run out of these. Uh, in many cases, you're going to run out of the available stock of peer reviewers, uh, and they they may get annoyed if you know, uh, if they're all asking the same reviewers and some of them can't get them. Uh, occasionally a press will say, you know, we have a sole submission policy. Uh, I've, I've never found that in recent years, but it can still happen. Um, if they say that, my own view from an ethical point of view is you should not lie to them. But if you say, I'm gonna honor that policy, you should not turn it around and then uh, sort of sneakily try to submit to another publisher, especially since publisher number one may well find out about it, given the potential overlap of peer reviewers. So if you tell, hypothetically, Oxford is not actually like this, Oxford will wait, you submit to more than one. Let's say Oxford says, this must be a sole submission. And you say, okay, I'll sole submit it to them. But then on the sly, you also try to submit it to Cambridge. There's a good chance Oxford will find out, they'll get mad, and it'll hurt your reputation. Um, so if you do run into one of your candidates is one that has a sole submission policy, unless you have a very strong reason why you feel like I must have this one, like, you know, everybody in your field says that this is the best one and, and no, 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 no other publication will matter. It's going to be Oxford or Bust or something like that. Unless it's like that, I might just say, skip that publisher, at least for your initial round of submissions, submit to two or three other publishers at the same level. Uh, and um, you know, just do just do things that way. Uh, so uh, should a PhD candidate write their dissertation to read like a book uh, if they can so that they can turn it around and publish it right away? Or should they just complete their dissertation because no matter what a manuscript uh, will, un uh, no matter what a manuscript will undergo massive revisions anyway? Yeah, so I think this may be a topic best discussed with people in your field. I think obviously in many cases, Priority one for a PhD student, and this also is discussed very well in Jason Brennan's book, which I mentioned earlier, which I recommend to all of you, is that the best dissertation is a done dissertation. The dissertation that doesn't get done will not get you a job. So if there's a trade-off between getting your dissertation done in a reasonable time and getting your first job versus making it more like a book, then you should getting it done should be prioritized. Um, I know from personal experience, you know, I, I was a JD PhD student, and I never did truly complete the PhD. I became a law professor, which doesn't require a PhD, but um, it was a mistake to let the ABD thing continue. It's a mistake that I paid for later in my career. So don't repeat my mistake. Your first priority should be to get the dissertation done. Um, but if there's a way that you can get it done, but also prepare it better uh, to be in a form uh, which can be published as a book, then by all means do that too. Just make sure that when you talk to your PhD advisor or your committee, make sure that the things that you do to make it a more effective book will not be things that alienate your committee. Um, I think most good scholars will know that 
it might be a good idea to try to publish your dissertation as a book. So they might be amenable to things that you might do to structure it in a way that uh, will increase the, odd, the odds of that. But you do want to make sure you don't do anything that alienates your advisor or other people on the committee, because you need those people's support to have the dissertation accepted. And also, obviously, to go on the job market and get placements. If your committee members are saying, well, this guy isn't very good and he was you know, he, he wrote a crappy dissertation with Zuzu was pursuing the false glory of trying to get a book, then, you know, that's obviously not a good scenario. For entry loss, uh, entry level law school hiring, how useful is a book versus a law review article? That's a good question. Very few entry level law school hires will have books on their CV. So in some respects, if you have one and it's with a good press, it will really stand out a lot. It will look very impressive, but it's not something that's expected. What is expected these days is that you will have two or three articles and other article projects in the works. But if you have a book project that's with a good press, either it's already published or more likely it's been accepted or the like, I think that can help you a lot because it, in some ways it will help you stand, stand out from the crowd. So it's not necessary. Uh, and you have to consider the opportunity cost question I mentioned earlier of, uh, you know, could you have just written more articles in the same period of time or done other things during the same period of time? But if you do have it and it's with a good publisher and it's on a good topic that's related to the field you want to be hired in, it will really make you stand out. Um, only maybe once or twice in the years that I've looked at entry level candidates have I actually seen somebody that had a book uh, uh, on their CV, uh, um, with the exception of people who are already scholars in another field or something like that. How much of the book should you have written before sending in a proposal? Uh, very little. Uh, one of the advantages, or at least it doesn't have to be much. It may be that you've only written the proposal itself, uh, and the only other thing you have may be some previous articles that you might work into the book. Uh, I've done things that way before. That's how I did the Grasping Handbook. That's how uh, initially I uh, did a couple of my other books as well. Uh, but uh, in other cases, I've had more of a complete manuscript already, so I've done you know, both processes before. But one advantage of the proposal route is that you can sort of scope out the amount of interest that there is in it before you actually write the book. And so if you have your contract with Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard or Chicago or whoever, that, provide, that lets you know there is a market for this book. And if I plow through and complete it, it will in fact be published most likely by this big name press. What kind of compensation can first-time academic book authors anticipate? <laughs> Sadly, the answer is not very much. Uh, there is a royalty provision in nearly all academic press contracts. The amount of royalties that you'll get will vary somewhat. Um, usually, it will be somewhere for first-time authors, maybe somewhere between about 5 or 7% of net proceeds from the book, which is the money that it brings in above uh, certain expenses. Um, uh, for the, in practical terms, for the numerous academic books that sell no more than five or 600 uh, copies, uh, you may make, you probably won't make more than a, a two, three or $400 from that. If your book sells several thousand copies, uh, you can make more than that. And you might even bring in, say, like $1,000 a year or something. My book, Democracy and Political Ignorance, makes me uh, several years after publication, it still makes me $500 to $1,000 a year. Uh, you can still also, uh, in some cases, get paid speaking engagements uh, from your books. If you publish an op-ed based on your book, some of the uh, newspapers or magazines are like, will pay you for their op-ed. So I actually make much more money from speaking engagements from my books than I make from the sale of the books themselves. But as a practical matter, unless your book really hits the big time and becomes you know, and sells tens of thousands of copies of the like, which is extremely rare, you cannot expect to get rich out of this. Uh, from I make probably more money off of uh, my books than, I don't know, maybe 90 or 95% of academics, but in a given year, I don't make more than maybe 15 or $20,000 from all my books combined. And that includes uh, revenue from speaking engagements as well as revenue from the books themselves. Uh, um, uh, that sounds like a lot, but remember that's from a total of like six or seven books. Uh, um, uh, so you should not expect to make a lot of money, but you can make some modest amount. There is always a chance that your book will really will break through to the big time. So 
Uh, you know, I, I've had books sell four or 5,000 copies, which is a lot for an academic book, but not an enormous amount for sort of like a, a true bestseller. Um, but if you sell, instead of 5,000, if you sell 50,000 or something like that, then, you know, that's, that's a lot more money. Yeah, it's kind of like musicians, right? You make money off the tours, not the album sales so much. <laughs> it depends on a musician. If you're Taylor Swift, uh, then, yeah, uh, it's true. <laughs> then it's a different ballgame. In general, in most cases, you can't expect a lot of revenue from these books. But if you're lucky and if you're successful, then it could add, you know, an additional nice supplement to your income. Uh, the next question is a bit meta. Uh, is there a book that you recommend for writing a book proposal? There are a couple of books about how to write a book proposal. Um, um, I'm not sure I truly recommend them. I would, I would recommend a couple of things though. One is you can read not my own thoughts in a bit greater detail in the relevant section on the IHS website. You can get that for free. Also, Bill Stunt, who is an editor at Yale University Press, he has a nice piece on the Yale University Press website, which is about how to write a proposal and what he thinks should be in it. And his way is not the only possible way to do it, but it's, uh, you know, but it's, it's useful uh, nonetheless. I, I understand, I think a few years ago, I believe it was the Daily New Philosophy blog, which actually had interviews with editors at several leading university or commercial academic publishers uh, where they talk about what they think should be in the proposal. But in general, I think there is no one way to write a proposal. There are many different organizational models you can have. I talk about a couple of them in the piece on the IHS website, but what you should make sure is you answer those four or five questions that I, you know, I mentioned earlier. If you have that and you have compelling answers to them, then you know, you're a long uh, way towards where you need to be. Great. Uh, did you ever use a professional editor outside of the book publisher? And if so, how did that go? I did not. In general, I didn't have a budget for doing things like that. And I found that working with the editors at the publisher was enough for me and occasionally you know, I would have friends or my wife or others read through some material as well. Uh, I do know academics who do use external editors. Um, uh, I can't say too much about that because I haven't done it myself. Uh, but one advantage, the external editor, if you think it's an advantage, is that they will usually go through the manuscript with a much more fine tooth comb than the most editors at academic presses will. If you think that you could use that to sort of improve your language or phraseology, or especially if English is not your native language and the book is in English, then that could be useful. On the other hand, uh, if you, you know, generally don't like to sort of uh, mull over every single word or every single phrasing choice and so on, then it can be sort of a real sort of tearing out your hair kind of experience. I've had that experience with op-ed editors sometimes that some newspapers, they will only edit your thing lightly. There are others where like, you know, they feel the need to make suggestions about every sentence and the like, and some of their suggestions are good, but others are like, this is really annoying and I'm annoyed that I have to spend time rejecting this suggestion. Um, so in general, I think it's not necessary, but it could be useful for certain particular people and situations. This actually leads right into the next question. Uh, could you say a little bit more about how to best get an op-ed accepted? In my own personal experience, uh, that's like been the hardest thing. I can get journals, <laughs> journal articles accepted. Yeah. Op-eds are really hard. So do you have anything to say about yeah. that? So unfortunately, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem that the best predictor of your ability to get new op-eds published if you published them before. Um, so uh, once I published my first few op-eds, it became much easier, uh, both because I could say, well, I published a previous op-ed in USA Today or Wall Street Journal, whatever it was. So I have credibility as an, an op-ed guy, if you will, uh, once I've done that. Um, but the other thing also is if you publish an op-ed in a place, you have a relationship with the editor or, uh, there, and you can just contact the editor directly and say, I have an op-ed for you. This is what I do now at this stage in my career. I just contact you know, I, I recently reached a tentative agreement to do an op-ed for The Hill because I already knew somebody at The Hill said, here's my idea. And they're like, okay, uh, now when I do, uh, uh, um, that doesn't mean they accept whatever I submit, but it does mean that they will at least give real consideration to it. Um, so if you're still hiring out, you haven't published any op-eds yet, it's obviously a tough situation. I would make two suggestions. One is, if at all possible, find out the name of the actual op-ed editor at whatever 
uh, website or newspaper or whatnot it is. Uh, you might be able to find out through somebody uh, who has previously written for that particular journal, or sometimes the public affairs office at your university, if you work for one, uh, will know if you work for a think tank or a research institute, they tend to know a lot of people. Sometimes also some staffers at IHS might know people like that. I think Nigel Ashford, for instance, had some uh, contacts of that sort. So if you have a relationship with IHS, they can help you. Um, in general, as with the book editors, but here even more so, if you can get your idea in front of the eyes of the person who actually gets to decide, then that's much better than if you go to the website of the Washington Post. They have a portal somewhere which say, well, you can submit your op-ed idea here, but there's probably like hundreds of people, most of whom are nutcases who do that, and the chance that they will even bother to look at your idea uh, in that context, if you submit it that way, is very low. Um, so you want to get that initial in. Um, similarly, if you get quoted by the media, uh, um, that increases your possibility of getting op-ed. And uh, the way I really get into it is by first being a, a blogger for the Bola Conspiracy One politics blog. If you're a blogger for a website that's well known in your academic community, sometimes members of the media will notice it and they will offer you op-ed opportunities in that way. I would add also that before you publish a book, you should contact all the people that you know in the media uh, to get them interested in it. If some of, some of them may want to review or even write an op-ed and the like, I got George Will to endorse a couple of my books actually because I met George Will at an event once. I emailed him and said, would you like to endorse the book? He said, yes. And in the case of one of the books, he actually wrote a column about the book. Uh, in the vast majority of these cases of outreach, they don't amount to much. There's another area where you have to be persistent. You have to expect that if you reach out, especially early in your career, you may reach out to 10 or 20 or 30 people and maybe only one or two of them will pan out. Uh, but those one or two will make it worth it. Great. Uh, do you think inviting uh, big names in your topics as the book reviewers uh, may make them more, more likely to reject uh, your proposal or your, or your manuscript? Uh, you mean to, to, as peer reviewers? Uh, yes, I believe that's the, the question. So in general, other things equal, you should list as big names as you can, but the big names should be people, that, ideally they should be people who know you and like your work. So if you list a big name, but you have no idea uh, whether that big name will actually uh, you know, like your proposal, then you're taking a risk. Uh, one possibility is they'll ask the big name to review it and the big name is, I just don't have time. That doesn't hurt you necessarily, but it doesn't help you either. If the big name reviews it and says, well, this is terrible, you should reject it, then uh, that will likely kill it. So by all means, recommend the big name, if, include the big name on your list if at all possible, but you should only include it if you know the person or at the very least you think that there's a high likelihood that they're gonna like your idea. Okay, I, uh, this one was a clarificatory question. Uh, did I hear you correctly that it's acceptable to submit to multiple publishers at once given that there's a strong norm against this in, uh, in their field for journal articles? Uh, or does the answer- Yeah, uh, yeah. Differ from yeah. publishers are different than journals. Yeah. In journals, there is a, in, at least in peer reviewed journals, there is indeed a strong norm against submitting to multiple ones. That norm, uh, does not exist for the most part among leading academic book publishers. Uh, it may have existed once, but you know, the last 10 or 15 years uh, that I've been doing this, uh, you know, it just either, either it isn't there at all or it's very weak. Are indexing and copy editing included in the book contract? Uh, good question. Copy editing generally, yes. The indexing, sometimes they will sneakily try to make you pay for it. Uh, that happened to me once. What, what I try to do, as if at all possible at the contract negotiation stage, I try to include a provision, get them to include a provision saying that they will pay for the index. But if not, um, an index for most books generally costs about eight or $900. Uh, and uh, you can, if you're an academic at a university, you usually will have an expense account that can help pay for that. You also have the option of doing an index yourself, which I did do once. I did it actually, I did it once when I was an undergraduate, I was a research assistant for a professor. Uh, uh, I got paid by the hour to do his index. Uh, and then later for my very first book, which was my undergrad dissertation, I had no clout at all. And I also had no idea what I was doing in the negotiations. I got stuck doing my own index for that. 
Um, it's very boring and tedious work. And if you can avoid it uh, and get the publisher to pay for it, you should, but you should keep in mind that this is, uh, um, th that this is one area where uh, many academic publishers tend to be sort of skin flints and they try to save some money by uh, sticking you with the um, uh, index expenses. If you have multiple offers, this is one of the things that you should include in your demands. Uh, and it will usually be granted, I think. Sometimes it'll be granted even if you don't have multiple offers but let them know that you want it. And as far as uh, indexing fees and other kinds of, of services with regard to publishing your work, I'll just put in a plug for uh, IHS's Hayek Fund for Scholars, yes. uh, which uh, can uh, often offset some of those expenses. Uh, so definitely uh, keep that in mind. Uh, we briefly lost uh, our uh, logistics director here, uh, but maybe we can drop that link into the uh, chat uh, right now. But unfortunately, we are at time. Uh, sorry to those of you whose questions we did not uh, get to, but thank you so much, uh, Professor Soman, uh, for a really informative uh, session here. I think we all learned a lot. Uh, and um, I want to thank you for sharing your advice. Uh, as an author myself, uh, I know how complicated the book publishing process can be. Uh, so your advice has been uh, really great, really helpful. And thank you to everyone in the audience who joined us today and asked questions. Um, we've recorded today's talk and we'll email it to you when it's available to watch. Uh, and also uh, before we shut down, uh, I want to remind you that the Institute for Humane Studies uh, does offer uh, various publication support uh, for academics. These things could range from manuscript workshops, papers workshops, or even just paper reviews. If you want to get the opportunity to hire a, a scholarly expert in your field, uh, we can set that up uh, in many cases, not always, but in some cases, uh, for sure. Uh, also, make sure you're subscribed to the IHS newsletter uh, so you can learn uh, more about uh, future opportunities. Uh, so uh, with that being said, thank you again, Professor Soman, and, and thanks uh, everyone else. Uh, be well uh, and take care. Thank you very much for having me.